Hello everyone, my name is Drew Parrish and I am a computer science major at the Northeast campus who really enjoys programming. I am also a proud advocate for minorities in STEM and will continue to welcome men and women of minority race into the CS field as well as any other STEM or educational field for that matter. Thank you for attending today's 11th annual Ab Abrazando Al Exito program. I would like to introduce Dr. Kenya Ayers Palmore, who is currently president of the Tarrant County College District's Northeast campus. She leads district level efforts to transform the student experience. Prior to the presidency, Ayers Palmer was the vice president and chair of the board for the Northwest Educational Council for Student Success, also known as the NECSS, where she helmed programs that were instrumental in Harper College's recent accomplishments in the area of student success for the K through 16 pipeline. She previously served as an academic dean for Harper College. Dr. Ayers Palmore served as an ACE Fellow for the FY16 while being mentored by Chancellor slash President Dr. Renu Kator of the University of Houston System. Ayers also managed multi-million dollar budgetary resources and has led multiple institutional initiatives responsible for forward momentum and sustainable transformation. Ayers Palmore was featured on the cover of, of the June slash July 2016 edition of the Community College Journal. President Ayers Palmore also holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in clinical psychology from the Eastern, Michi from the Eastern Michigan University. She, also, she has also earned a doctorate of education in administration and supervision from the University of Houston. Dr. Ayers Palmore has served in leadership capacities in Florida, Texas, Illinois, Washington, DC, and Michigan. She was state coordinator for the Michigan ACE Network for Women Leaders in Higher Education, catalyzing the leadership capacity for women statewide. She's a highly sought after speaker for organizations nationwide. Ayers Palmore served as a consultant evaluator for the Middle States Association and the Higher Learning Commission and, and now serves for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. In 2001, Dr. Ayers Palmore was named by Ebony Magazine as one of the top 30 leaders of the future 30 and under. Ayers Palmore is an internationally published author and a former syndicated radio show host. In alignment with her community interests, President Ayer, Ayers Palmore has worked with the homeless and prison populations. And I now welcome you, the legendary Dr. Kenya Ayers Palmore. Good afternoon. If you truly value resilience, strength, passion, commitment, and stories of triumph and courage, then you have come to the right event. If you value alignment with those who share a commitment to using their lives to ensure lasting impact or legacy, if you will, then you have come to the right event. And if you are interested in embracing advocacy, culture, and wisdom, from those who have paved the way before us, then you have come to the right event. This year, our theme, Expressing Your Authentic Self, offers a clarion call to each attendee to show up in the world as your incredible, brilliant, resplendent self. Today, our greatest hope is that you will leave this conference encouraged that who you are is wonderful, powerful, and indeed enough. The world has need of what you alone can offer us. We need you to be just who you are. On behalf of our chancellor, Dr. Eugene Giovannini and his cabinet, along with the dedicated team who is working on this first ever live event and the dedicated planning committee for today's conference, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Tarrant County College to this year's 2020 Abrazando Al Exito 2020. Welcome as well to our esteemed guest, Dr. Florencio Aranda III and Max Cromichel. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for all that you will add to make this an incredible day. If you are looking to be uplifted, you've come to the right event. Welcome. We're glad you're here.
Hello, you can hear me? Okay. So let me let me restart there real fast. So thank you, Dr. Ayers Palmore, for your welcome. And now for the introduction for our first keynote speaker. Florencia Aranda III, Doctor of Philosophy, has dedicated his life to leadership, service, and advocacy and research. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Political Science, a Master of Arts in Romance Languages, and a Master of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies for and a Ph and a PhD in higher education from Texas Tech University and a Master of Library Sciences from Legal Studies from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. His extensive education has allowed him to advocate for underrepresented and underserved students. Aranda is a student affairs professional and diversity advocate at South Dakota State University, where he focuses on the retention and degree completion of Latinx students. Moreover, he advocates for di diversity, inclusion, access, and multiculturalism as the new professional representative and chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the South Dakota Higher Education Association, as well as chair of the Mentorship Program for Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education. Now welcoming the keynote speaker. Hello everyone, how is everyone doing today? Buenas tardes and happy Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Um, I'm Dr. Florencio Diaz Aranda III. Um, Carter, is there, is there a way that I am gonna see the PowerPoint as well? Because I just see my face. My apologies. Okay, perfect. So I'm Dr. Florencio Diaz Aranda III, and today I will be um, I will be addressing you all. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you to Tarrant County College District uh, for having me today. Um, I will be speaking today about something that is very near and dear to me. Something that. Um, that I have have really dedicated my life to, and that is um, the work that I do as a as an education uh, political and and edu and um, and cultural advocate. So today's presentation is called Cuevas, Consejos, Congreso y Colegio navigating educational, political, and cultural arenas. Um, so before I begin, I would like to say that please note that this is my experience and you may hear things that that you have done differently or that you say differently and that's what makes us both unique. Whether you can relate to what I'm saying or not, I ask that you're empathetic um, as this is my journey and how I made it my own. Um, I would also like to say that um, the suggestions, the information and the recommendations that I'm gonna make today are based on what I have experienced as an individual and what I have researched and done throughout my life. Therefore, it may very well in fact be different from yours and that is okay. Um, so let me, perfect. Um, if, if we can move on to the first slide. So I'm Dr. Florencio Urias Aranda III. I was born and raised in rural West Texas and it borders with Mexico. I came from very humble beginnings. My family um, was low socioeconomic status and I attended and graduated from Texas public K through 12 education. I went on to be a first generation college student and eventually a first generation college graduate. And I have 16 years of experience in higher education from part time to full time um, work related and that professional experience. But before I talk to you about being that educational, political and cultural advocate, I think it's essential that we 
um, get a better understanding of my family's history and, and why I am who I am today and, and what has led me to today. So next slide, please. So here you will see photos of my grandparents, mis abuelitos. On the Oria side, my grandmother, she did not surpass third grade. My grandfather did not surpass second grade. My grandmother was a field crop worker and a food service and was in food service. She lost her mother when she was 10 years old and she lived in Mexico. And so what, when she lost her grand, her mother, my grandfather, my great grandfather would go out to the fields and, and, and to, to try and make a living for the family. So my grandmother actually had to live in cuevas or caves and take care of her younger siblings. This was at the age of 10 and at the age of 14, she married my grandfather who was 22 years old. My grandfather was a farmhand, a goat herder and a field crop worker. Together they had seven children and they migrated from Mexico. And on the Aranda side, my abuelos paternos, they were uh, my grandmother, she reached second grade and my grandfather had no formal education at all. Um, he had no father figure, and he actually started working at the age of 12 as a rancher, to which he did up until when he retired at age of 60. My grandmother was a field crop worker. They had nine children, and they migrated from Mexico. So next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit then about my immediate family. We were we were born and raised in Presidio, Texas, USA, which borders with Ojinaga, Chihuahua, Mexico. My parents' education did not surpass high school. My dad has a high school diploma. My mother dropped out at 10th grade and they married in December of 1980 when they were 18 and 16 years old. My father throughout his life has been a field crop worker, a yard cleaner, an oil rig hand and rancher. And my mother was a field crop worker, dishwasher, crop packer, cashier, and a ranch hand and a housewife. Together, they had three children, my eldest sister, Joanne, Desert, uh, Florencio, myself, and Desiree Marie. Next slide, please. What I think uh, in order for me to really tell you about who I am and, and how I came to be, I'd like to share a very quick story with you all. A grandfather gently shook his grandson awake. Startled, he looked up at his grandfather, concerned about what he was going to hear. Se llevaron a tu hermanita al hospital porque se puso muy mal, his grandfather whispered. The eight-year-old boy began to cry because he was left at home while his little sister was rushed to the hospital. Tus papás y hermanita van a regresar, te lo prometo. The grandfather said to ease his grandson's frustration. The grandfather promised him that his baby sister would return. That promise was broken two nights later when his baby sister passed away. My hermanita passed away. Next slide, please. So at age eight, I, I lost my youngest sibling and my parents had each other. My sister had uh, her school friends and as an eight year old little boy, I had nobody. And I really started to focus my attention on getting rid of that sad frustration, that negative energy and at eight years old, I tell people that I grew up. I grew up because that's when I realized that if an, a one-year-old little girl can be taken from this world, then why couldn't an eight-year-old boy? So I started to really hone in on who I wanted to be and the impact that I wanted to make. Yes, at eight years old, I was thinking like that. So when, when she passed, it was difficult, but you know, I started to focus on education. And next slide, please. And that's when my parents 
uh, and grandparents realized that I was really gifted when it came to education. And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother told me, el que sabe dos idiomas vale por dos. Con humildad y con Dios, todo es posible, porque sin él no somos nada. So from a very young age, my grandmother instilled that knowing two languages and being humble and being um, faith, having faith that anything was possible. And then as I progressed through school, next slide please. My, my parents told me, promise us that you will make more of yourself without forgetting where you came from. Promise that someday you will become somebody and don't settle for being nobody like us. Prometenos que serás alguien importante en esta vida y que nunca te darás por vencido. So looking back in retrospect, this was really the promise that my parents demanded of me that set the foundation of who I was and what I wanted to do with my life. I was heartbroken knowing that they thought that they were nobody, especially considering that we had lived paycheck to paycheck, that we made very little money, and that, um, you know, they had lost my youngest sibling. So for them, they felt that they had failed us as parents. And on the contrary, I thought they were some of the most amazing people in my life. And so I took that upon myself when they demanded this promise. I said, I'm going to have to make something for myself, for them as well. So next slide, please. That's when I started to really commit to high school. And on the right side, you'll see some of the main things that really set the foundation of my high school education and, and that propelled me to decide and to want to seek a post-secondary education. Also during that time, my family had started getting involved in our local politics. And, and I, I knew at that point that while they had promised, they had demanded a promise of me, I was also seeing the responsibility that they had taken upon themselves to better the community that we were in. And so that's when I decided to study political science and Spanish at Texas Tech University. Next slide, please. And when I matriculated at Texas Tech University, reality hit. I was a Latino, male, low socioeconomic status, remedial student, first generation at a predominantly white institution. I quickly was confronted with many obstacles. What was I going to eat later that night? Did I have enough money to pay for my textbooks? Was I going to have enough uh, financial aid to pay for, for my class for that semester? And so while it was tough, I still remember the words that my grandfather said. And next slide, please. He said, siga estudiando. Y si necesita algo, déjeme saber. No se raje. This man was such a traditional macho individual and who demanded and expected the wife to have food at the table, the wife to stay home, to be submissive, to be the angel del hogar. And yet here he was telling me, the later generation, to keep studying and that if I needed anything to let him know and for me not to give up. For me, looking back, while I know that it was difficult for him to accept, that I was not following his typical traditional Mexican path. He was willing to put that pride aside so that I could become more because he, he saw something in me. And I remembered those words and that's what led me to getting super highly involved in a lot of organizations. So next slide, please. These were the organizations that really changed the trajectory of my college going experience. While I was at Texas Tech University, I completed my undergrad in three years, got a full ride to get my master's in Spanish and, and Portuguese, 
and then I decided, hey, let's give this PhD thing a try. And as I was in the PhD journey, I realized that I was the lonely only Latino in my PhD program. And I asked myself, why? What have I done? What have you done, Florencio, that's so different? What has allowed you to make it and not fall through the cracks like most of your colleagues, like most of the other Latino students that you had seen um, start your freshman year, but after a semester or two, no longer be there. So that's when I decided, next slide please, to really start honing in and trying to find ways for me to give back, for me to create a change. And that's when I got involved in um, the school government at Texas Tech University. And that's when I realized that as a Latino, I had something valuable to bring to the table. And as a Latino, I knew that I needed to prove to people that we as Latinos could actually do it. Moreover, that I, as a member of a historically marginalized underrepresented population, could do it and to prove that other people from historically marginalized underrepresented populations could do it as well. So as I was doing my graduate government stuff, I decided to embark on a, uh, next slide please. I decided to embark on a journey that was not really, um, that was not very typical or traditional. So during my PhD, I decided to do a congressional internship in Washington, DC, but I was very intentional in what, where I wanted to work. I wanted to work in the congressional district of my people, the people from the border, the people from West Texas. And so I interned with Congressman Pete P. Gallego, and that's where I really learned about the inner workings of our government. And I said, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And this, these are the people that are truly making an impact and that create rules and regulations that impact any other aspect of our lives. And so that's when I decided that I wanted to get more involved. And that's when I, uh, Next slide, please. So that's when I decided to take it a step further. And at that point I said, while I'm not a political figure, I want to stay involved in politics, but I want to do it my way. I'm an educational person and I wanted to promote and move forward through education, but I knew that I had to get involved with the political sphere in order to make that happen. And that's when I got involved with the National Association of Graduate Professional Students. And if you can see here, while it was an education organization, I was dealing with politics already, and I was also the social justice chair. So I was dealing with culture once again. And that's what really started to solidify my, my purpose and my passion for wanting to intertwine these three arenas. And so next slide, please. And that's when I, um, in the PhD, when I left Washington DC, I went back to Texas Tech University and I said, Latino US political figures and US higher education is what I'm gonna study. And through that, next slide please, I decided to focus my doctoral work on the higher education pathways of Latino US congressmen. And so I wanted to highlight the narratives of hombres Latinos. And as I was interviewing Tony Cárdenas, Henry Cuellar and Raúl Grijalva, I realized that I wasn't that different from them. 
that while they were political figures, they were working hard to provide access and opportunity to Latinos seeking education. And I was trying to do the same thing as well. And so again, while I was not the political figure, I knew that I could still be involved and share my narrative as an hombre Latino and find ways to help other Latino seeking, um, others Latino seeking education. Next slide, please. So that's when I um, was able to, I, I was able to go to college and, and achieve, um, I was able to achieve the unexpected. I, I was able to achieve five post-secondary degrees, four from Texas Tech University, and one from Arizona State University. And I share that with you today because as I was progressing and getting each degree, it, each moment humbled me more and more and more. And so next slide show, next slide please. And so I wanted to very quickly share what helped me. That was my family. That uh, what helped me get those degrees was my parents' dream for me, their desire for me to become educated. My family and my siblings and that academic familia helping me along the way. But most importantly, those educational policies and support systems throughout the way. And next slide, please. So once I was, once I had that, and once I knew what had helped me, I said, this is what I want to do. I have this desire to serve. I have this value of giving back. And I wanted to intertwine that, that cultural, educational and political arenas. And so I started to do that, next slide, by getting involved in the professional staff government at Texas Tech University as you know as now a professional staff member and as i was working through there i realized florencio you have so much more to give your narrative is so unique therefore find a way to give back to continue to give back and that's when i started next slide please that's when i started to focus my attention on presenting my research on empowering my narrative and getting involved with as many organizations as possible. And, and this slide represents uh, um, a few of the, of the organizations that I have presented at or that have heard my narrative one way or another. And then the inevitable happened. Next slide, please. As I was presenting the political arena got in contact with me. Um, so next slide, please. The political arena got got in contact with me and they said, Florencio, as an individual that has done education, we would like for you to provide some of your research on Latino males so that we can incorporate it as part of our, as part of our, um, our legislative agenda and so that's when i started to get involved with um with the political sphere after that next slide please i was asked to give testimony um about the texas top 10 percent rule and it was my voice that was being featured by these congressional figures at or state legislators in Texas about how the Texas top 10% rule changed my life. And so after doing that, I said, this is exactly what I want to do. I want, I, I feel most fulfilled when I help historically marginalized underrepresented students. So I want to commit to education so that I can do something for them, so that I can be that resource. Why? Because I was them not too long ago. And I knew that I had the experience and had been able to succeed, so I wanted to give back. And so what do I do now? So transition to that 
slide of what I do now. Now I serve as the Multicultural Latinx Retention Advisor at South Dakota State University. I stay involved in professional educational organizations such as South, the South Dakota Higher Education Association, where I serve as a Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee Chair. I created a, a mentoring program for, the, for SDHEA, and I also represent new professional representatives. And with the Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education, I created the mentorship program that currently has 22 mentorship pairs that are benefiting from one another and, and they're doing it through education and through the employment within higher education. So some of the cultural things that I do on campus are Cesar Chavez Week, Hispanic Heritage Month, Dia de los Muertos, we bring an infusion of Latin, Latinx focused meetings and programming, and we collaborate intersectionally with our diversity related partners. I'm also the advisor for the uh, Latin American Student Association. Um, I'm the chair of Los Hombres Latinos that focuses on aiding male students of color, and I continue to have conversations as a diversity and inclusion advocate on campus. And so um, how do I give back? So aside from doing that as a professional uh, standpoint in my employment, I give back by uh, providing students with financial support. Uh, currently, I, I'm, I have five recipients of the Dr. Florencio Uranda Scholarship, and I've provided other scholarships, um, one-time scholarships to different organizations to, to, to give to students that are succeeding academically. And one of the most rewarding things that I do is that I mentor students. And here uh, on this slide for mentoring students, you'll see some of the students from the various uh, institutions from across the United States. And so to end this PowerPoint and, and this presentation, um, how can you change? How can you change? Um, how can you change, uh, create change, right? And I think what's important is that you stay in school and using the words of my very macho abuelo to honor him since he has passed, no te rajes or don't give up. Encourage others, uh, seek support from higher education associations, education-based organizations. Increase your political advocacy and vote. It's essential that we vote. Seek an elected office, whether that is in your school politics or local government or a state or federal government, or work with elected officials. Seek mentorship, be a mentor or, or seek a mentor. Get involved in the institutional decision making or the legislative decision making. Don't forget about your family and community. Involve them in the college going process work to increase that Latino um, representation at our institutions or organizations. And I think the most important things is to follow your pathway, share your narrative and your testimonial and empower others to do the same. And as you're doing all that, and as you're very involved, be your authentic self. And remember, if not me, then who? And with that, I wanted to very quickly close that. Therefore, whether I'm advocating in political settings or putting on a cultural event or training sessions or taking part in educational discussions and decision making, I embrace who I am. And I acknowledge and embrace who, how others are. And what I wanted to share with you today, and if there's anything that one thing that you should take from this entire talk today is what can you bring to the table? And I asked myself, what do I bring to the table? The answer is I bring me. I bring my lived experiences, mi lenguaje, los dichos de mi familia, the struggles, our traditions, I bring my family's history because they've shaped who I am. I also bring the adversity. I, 
and while I know that I'm able to articulate certain things and, and that I have the credentials and the experience and the professionalism, I strive to bring my genuine self. I bring my unapologetic self, my resilient self, my driven self, and my cultured self. And always remembering, if not me, then who? And I bring my adversity. I bring my vulnerability and I bring my success because my journey can be seen in the journey of others, of other Latinos and other historically marginalized and underrepresented populations. And that's what I bring. I bring my narrative, my testimonio. So if you ever have a doubt of whether you're worthy or whether you have what it takes, you do. Because when you bring yourself to the table, everyone wins. With that, muchísimas gracias, and I know I've gone over time. So if the Q&A is not possible, I completely understand. Thank you so much for your um, inspirational story and message, Dr. Aranda. Um, I think we are, yes, I think we still have some time for a quick Q&A session. And let me look at the questions here really quickly. Can you hear me? Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, so first question I have here, it, it says from Anonymous, um, where in West Texas are you from? Yeah, so thank you for that question. And I appreciate people asking me because um, that, that that place really, my ranchito, my little town is what shaped me. And I'm from Presidio, Texas. It borders with Ojinaga, Chihuahua, Mexico. So it is um, really south in between El Paso, Texas and Big Bend National Park. So somewhere along that border. Awesome, awesome. Yes, thank you. And then for our second question, um, it says hospital in Mexico or Texas? Yeah, so, um, well, I, I always tell people that Mexico gave so much to me. Um, I grew up very bilingual, bicultural, bilateral in that I depended on both worlds a lot. And I actually didn't have any medical insurance until I obtained my first ever professional employment because it was so convenient and so accessible to just seek medical um, help uh, from, from the Mexican side. And so um, my sister, she passed. Um, so she was, di she was uh, taken care of in Mexico, but then they flew her to Lubbock, Texas, where she ended up passing. And so uh, a little bit of both, right? So that hospitalization and kind of my medical experience has always been on both sides of the border. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. I think we're going to wait a few minutes just in case anyone has any remaining questions. Oh, I see one here. It says, can you speak to that grit you said that had moved you through your difficult experiences? Yeah, absolutely. And and thanks again for that question. Um, prior to knowing what grit was, um, for me, it was just ganas. And, and that's kind of the way that I translate grit to whenever Latinx, uh, Latino, Spanish speakers are talking to me. I had the ganas, I had that drive because I, I saw my upbringing, I saw my parents' upbringing, and I knew that that I had what it took in order to be able to do that, in order to leave that, um, in order to leave that, that, you know, that setting. Um, for me, what really hit home was when I was walking the halls in, in, in Congress in DC, I stepped off the elevator 
at that point I was a PhD student. I was about to finish my PhD. Um, I was working in the US Capitol. I had just gotten off the phone with my parents. And when I got off of that elevator, I started to cry. And the reason why I was crying is because at that point it hit me that that grit, that those ganas had elevated me to a new place where I was no longer going to experience the difficulty that my family, that my family and my grandparents had experienced. And, and I had at that point, I realized that I had broken that part that cycle of poverty that I was no longer ever going to experience the, 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 the hardship that they had. And while one would say, wow, Florencio, so now you said, oh, awesome, you, you succeeded, get big headed, move on. For me, it was the contrary. I said, okay, now that you've done it, what are you gonna do to bring others with you? And so that's actually what propelled me to keep moving forward and to keep intertwining those educational, cultural, and political uh, arenas so that I could continue to show people that here's uh, uh, an individual with no money, with a very impoverished background, with humble beginnings, yet I was able to make it. And so I wanted to be that representative and I wanted to show people that they too could make it and that despite their circumstances, um, if they worked hard and had the ganas, that grit, that they too could do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, so, you much. so much. And um, um, I just wanted to remind everyone one, that the uh, silent yes, auction is going on until 450. So make sure you go on your go and bid on your favorite on your favorite basket and help us raise money for student scholarships. It is now time for our breakout sessions. So please head over to your breakout session of your choice. You can click on the link that you received in your RSVP email or you can go to the bit link that is on that is on your program. And after the breakout session, please return to this live event for our presentation of the Dr. Magdalena de la Teja Abrazando Al Exito winner and Dr. Croc Mall, our second keynote speaker. Have fun in the breakout sessions.
We would like to recognize our 11th Dr. Magdalena de la Teja Abrazando Al Exito Scholarship winner, Yuanelli Garza. Ms. Garza is very involved in many activities at TCC, but that does not stop her from a 4.0 and a Phi Theta Kappa membership. Her goals are to graduate from TCC with an associate's degree and then transfer to the University of Texas at Arlington to be accepted into the nursing program. After completion of her bachelor's degree, she would like to become a registered nurse and pursue her master's degree and become a nurse practitioner. Congratulations to Mrs. Garza. And before we introduce our keynote speaker, just a reminder that our silent auction is still going on, so there are still great things up for grabs, so head, so head over and put in your bid. This auction closes at 450, so please head on over. And now for an introduction for Dr. Krokmal. Dr. Krokmal, PhD, is an Associate Professor of History and Founding Chair of the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. He is he's the author of Blue Texas, The Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era, winner of the Frederick Jackson Turner Award of the Organization of American Historians, the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies Teja Foco Nonfiction Book Award and other accolades. He also directs the Civil Rights and he also directs the Civil Rights in Black and Brown Oral History Project, which has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Croc Mall serves as a co-chair of the Fort Worth Independent School District Racial Equity Committee and is, a, and is an active member of United Fort Worth. He majored in Community Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, before his graduate degrees in, in history at Duke University. Introducing Dr. Max Crockmall. Okay, thank you for that warm introduction. It's great to be here with all of you today. And uh, let me just confirm, can you see the, the, the PowerPoint or are you seeing my presentation slide? Are you good to go? Okay. Um, all right, you should see a PowerPoint full screen. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's working. Well, thank you all. It's great to be here. Um, it's wonderful to always be with a TCC audience and particularly uh, be part of uh, uh, Latinx Heritage, Hispanic Heritage Month, and Abrazando el, el, el Exito. Um, so thank you for having me and, um, and for everybody for participating throughout the day. Um, so I, I'm a historian. I'm going to talk about the Chicano movement, and I'm, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move through it rather quickly. And uh, and if I start running out of time, someone please tell me. Uh, but um, you know, a lot of you may not even know what the Chicano movement is, right? And uh, it may be a, a word you've heard or a phrase you've heard. Um, and Indeed, you know, uh, I, it conjures all sorts of, of different responses, and so I, we can't really do Q and A right now. But you know, I often I often say, "What do you what do you think of when you hear Chicano?" and and just pause for a moment, maybe, and think about what is what is that uh, what associations do you have with the Chicano movement? What does it make you think about? So I teach a course on this, and I take students to go. And, 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 and learn in the field and also learn directly from activists who are involved. And so now, right, in this moment of, of Black Lives Matter, right, of a resurgent immigrant rights movement, it's a great time to think about the Chicano movement, this mass social movement, right, that brought together uh, young people and elders of uh, Mexican descent to truly transform uh, American politics, American race relations, uh, everything about um, the American Southwest, about Texas in particular. Uh, and so this is like a timeline from when I teach it with my class. You can see it's, it's messy, right? There's all kinds of stuff going on. And on the top half, we have events that are um, from the, uh, the sort of national story, right? We think about things like Cesar Chavez, and we'll talk more about him in a minute. Uh, but then on the bottom also, we have quite a bit from Texas. So the Chicano movement, um, it took place here in Texas and it, and it was, um, it was powerful and important, right? And, and it's a, a huge social movement that you probably learned very little about, but in fact is really central to who we are as a state, as a nation, and I think also where we're going. So what is the Chicano movement? It's complicated. Uh, and so I recommend that you check out this book. I'm not gonna be able to get into it today in any where as much depth as, as Maceo Montoya does in this wonderful book. Um, but so the Chicano movement, you know, broadly speaking was a movement uh, to uh, for civil rights, right? A movement among Mexican-American 
Mexican extraction people uh, for civil rights in America. And, and it was considered radical at the time in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but that's in part because it, um, you know, it, it challenged some old assumptions about who Mexican Americans were and what their rightful place was in our society, right? We'd been in the age of what I call Juan Crow, right? A system of segregation that had relegated Mexican Americans, right, to uh, to the bottom of the economy, to un, un, um, unfair schools, right? To separate and unequal schools, to neighborhoods that were often disinvested in, uh, to, to police violence. Um, and so the Chicano movement was a broad, diffuse, decentralized movement, right, that really changed all of that. It was pathbreaking. It defined a generation of activists as well as just the whole community, right, of Mexican origin people in the United States. Um, and, and part of what it was, as, was, was a, as I mentioned, a radical shift, right? It adopted an ethos of Chicanismo. So, you know, you again, you learn about the African-American civil rights movement, which is incredibly important. Sometimes you might learn about the Black Power movement, but the Chicano movement was uh, not just a, a replica of that, but an indigenous organic movement of Mexican-Americans who, uh, who exhibited these new ideas, right? And then they organized in mass and built a massive movement led by young people that, as I said, completely changed the world. Um, so what was Chicanismo, right? It was this new philosophy, right? This new spirit, these new ideas. The word Chicano, right? Uh, it, it is a, a shortened version of me Mexicano, Mexicano. Um, it, it was used mostly as a pejorative term, right? In, in the barrios in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and today it circulates often to mean, a, a, you know, a US oriented Mexican American, right? A, a gringo, agringado, Chicano, right? Um, but, but uh, it was it was often kind of used as an epithet, and and so what the what the Chicano youth Chicana youth did was they reclaimed this term and they said we're we're proud to be Chicano. We have this new political and cultural orientation, right? Instead of just uh, fighting for civil rights um, and for inclusion in America and for assimilation, uh, we want to be recognized as a as a as something else, as a hybrid group, as a group that is brown rather than white, and proud to be brown. Right, a group that 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 wants um, inclusion in America, but not erasure of the distinctive indigenous and mestizaje culture that people bring north from Mexico and then reinvent here in the United States. So uh, the Chicano movement put forward this new identity, this new orientation, right, this new concept of a united people um, brought together by their hybridity, by being mestizaje, by being brown and proud. The, the, the ethos of Chicanismo called for people to come together in collective unity and also to practice carnalismo, right? A, a brotherhood, a way in which um, different communities, uh, or sorry, diff different, different folks uh, who, who might previously think of themselves as being in one neighborhood or another, right? North side, south side, wherever it might be, came to understand instead that they had brotherhood by being part of, of this Chicano uh, group in the United States, right? A group that was subject to Juan Crow, to subject to discrimination, and that was going to come together and celebrate their heritage and fight back. It celebrated, as I mentioned, indigenous roots of, of Mexican American culture, um, of, celebrated the use of the Spanish language, bilingual and bicultural uh, communities. Um, and, and the Chicano movement was oriented around these ideas of Chicanismo, right? So yet another one, uh, it was anti-imperialist, right? Whereas previous generations of Mexican Americans had celebrated their service, say, in World War II, right, and claimed that they were full citizens because they had sacrificed for America. Well, the Chicano movement turned some of that around in the era of the war in, in Vietnam and said, no, actually, we identify as brown people, as, as colonized people on the world stage, and we're, and, and, we're, and we're against imperialism in all its forms, right, whether that's the United States involvement in Vietnam, or the fact that they saw themselves as living in occupied Aslan, right, as in territory that was itself part of, uh, of the Aztec empire, right, before the Aztecs migrated south from the American Southwest, this was their homeland and they migrated south into the Central Valley of Mexico only later. And so they saw the Southwest as occupied Aslan, right, as a colony, an internal colony in the United States that needed to be liberated. Now, some of the ideas of Chicanismo were a little exclusive, right? And they were critiqued by Chicana feminists, by liberals, by people on the political right. And we can talk more about that maybe as, as we go. Um, but right, so, so the, the important thing to take away from this, right, is that there was this moment in the late 1960s 
when led by young people, right, instead of seeing their ethnicity as a, as a sign of um, something to be ashamed of, right, instead of trying to, to whiten and try to, trying to fit in, uh, Chicano said, no, we're going to be brown and proud and different, and we're going to celebrate all of the things that make us different, and we're going to organize politically uh, and social movements around all of these things that make us distinctive, right, and reclaim, occupy Aslan for ourselves and have self-determination in those places. All right, so I'm going to run through a few quick threads of the Chicano movement. As I said, it was broad, it was diffuse, it was decentralized. So there's a lot of different nodes to it. So I'm going to run through some of the more familiar nodes. Of course, the most familiar right here in the center of the screen is Cesar Chavez, right, and his work with the United Farm Workers. So Chavez, as you as you may know, right, was born in Arizona in 1927. He uh, he grew up in the barrios of, of East San Jose uh, in a neighborhood called Sal Si Puedes, right? Get out if you can. Uh, but he became involved in a group called the Community Services Organization and began organizing people in the community to register to vote, to become literate, to become citizens if they were not yet citizens and were eligible, um, and to start building power at the community level in the neighborhoods and demanding, you know, basic services like paved streets, right, or or uh, or uh, plumbing, right, in in neighborhoods that had long been neglected. Uh, at some point in 1962, Chavez, along with Dolores Huerta, break away from um, the CSO and they formed the National Farm Workers Association. And in 1965, right, they joined the grape strike that takes place in Delano, California, right, which is actually initiated by Filipino workers, uh, but also Mexican American workers quickly join in and it becomes a key strike of the United, what becomes the United Farm Workers. The next year in 1966, Chavez leads a march, a pilgrimage, or they call it a peregrinación. It's an Easter. Uh, march uh, to the capital in Sacramento, in which they bring attention to the poor conditions facing farm workers and are able to uh, pressure uh, several wine companies into recognizing their union and getting a union contract. So less well known than that is that the union also had a presence right here in Texas, uh, and particularly in the Rio Grande Valley. So just the same year as, as, the, as the march in Sacramento, uh, there was a strike in the melon fields in Starr County, in, in Rio Grande City and the surrounding area in the valley. Uh, and that strike also turned into a, a large movement where um, unable to get recognition at work, they marched all the way to Austin in the middle of summer. They marched from the 4th of July all the way until Labor Day in order to demand a living wage for farm workers. Uh, and the strike continued into 1967. Right? And of course, Chavez goes on to lead the, the boycott against table grapes. He famously fasts um, and then breaks his fast right in a hunger strike. Um, to, to again win justice for farm workers, um, and uh, and so you know about Chavez. I'll, that's enough about Chavez. On his left is uh, Juan Cornejo. So you've probably never heard of Juan Cornejo, but Juan Cornejo was from Crystal City in Savala County in the Winter Garden region of Texas, the spinach capital of the world, right? And this was a town that was predominantly Mexicano through all of its history, but it was had been taken over and dominated by Anglo planters, right? Um, and and so this is a town in which democracy did not exist, right? In which the white parts of town had nice streets and good services and good schools. And across the tracks in the, in the Mexicano part of town, um, they had none of those things. And so Juan Cornejo joined an organization called PASO, the Political Association of Spanish Speaking Organizations, uh, which was led statewide by a man named Albert Pena from San Antonio, a county commissioner, a political activist who had been organizing since the 50s. He was part of the Viva Kennedy campaign to elect John F. Kennedy in 1960. Uh, and so Paso uh, started fanning, you know, all over the state and, and, um, and Albert Pena eventually sends emissaries to Crystal City where they meet up with Juan Cornejo. And Cornejo uh, then forms a coalition, right? He is himself uh, working in the spinach industry. He works in a packing plant uh, there in um, for Del Monte in, in, in Cristal. And, um, and so Paso forms an alliance with, with, with him and other members of the Teamsters Union, of which he's a business agent, and with local high school students, right, led by someone who goes on to become very famous, Jose Angel Gutierrez, right, later uh, a political scientist um, who uh, taught at UT Arlington for, for many years. So Jose Angel Gutierrez had just got graduated from high school. He comes back, links up with Cornejo and Paso, and they decide to run five candidates for office, and they become Los Cinco. And for the first time, there's an old Mexican slate of worker uh, of, of candidates. They um, they register voters on unprecedented scale, 
and uh, and they bring democracy to Crystal City for the first time. The majority participates in politics. They vote. They get Los Cinco get elected, and Juan Cornejo becomes the mayor. And this becomes known in, in Texas as the first Chicano revolt, right? The beginning, in many ways, of the Chicano movement. And it's even earlier. It's 1963. It's before the United Farm Workers and, and Chavez gets gets his start uh, on a national scale. And this this moment, right, where they take over the local government, reverberates across the Southwest and across the nation, and it really sets a template for for later action. Um, so this is a forgotten history, right? And um, at least at, when I was last there uh, a couple of years ago, Mr. Cornejo is still alive, right? He still remembers all of these days. And I should also add that the Texas Rangers were not too happy about this, right? The state police force actually reacted uh, violently toward the members of PASO and the high school students and others who were out registering people to vote and, and trying to turn people out to vote. People even lost their jobs for participating in this campaign. Some people were beaten or threatened with violence. Um, but nonetheless, they, they, you know, they persevered and they won, uh, at least for a time. And, and, um, and they inspired right, a whole wave of activism in other places in Texas. Meanwhile, in New Mexico on the far right, Reyes Lopez Tierrina uh, led another movement called La Alianza Federal de Mercedes, or the National Land Grant Movement. Um, Lopez Tierrina was a migrant farm worker himself. He was born in 1926. He eventually becomes a Pentecostal minister. He's very charismatic. He's a great orator. If you Google him, you can find old clips, I imagine. Uh, there's an old film called Chicano, and you can see it there if nowhere else. Uh, but, but you know, he was a great orator, and he spoke in Spanish. Um, and he got together with local families in New Mexico. And, and as, a, as a traveling minister, uh, he learned about the issues they faced, uh, and particularly the land grants, right? Many people in, in New Mexico were descended from families that had received land grants from Spain or from Mexico before the United States conquest. And, and they still retained legal title to these lands, but the lands had been seized and used by Anglo occupiers. And so, um, so Reyes Lopez de Arena gets together with these local families and they start petitioning Mexico for help in reclaiming the land grants that were taken illegally after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And then they form La Alianza, right, to start um, uh, pushing this claim on a larger level. So in 18, 1963, in February, 800 delegates came together representing 48 New Mexico land grants at the founding convention of La Alianza. And they focused in particularly on the Tierra Amarilla and San Joaquin del Rio de Chama grants, where they tried to um, make a case, right, that these land grants were still valid, that the original owners of these lands needed to have their, um, their, their title recognized once again. Of course, the local Anglo authorities wanted nothing to do with that. And so the Alancistas occupied um, some of the land. They occupied the Echo Amphitheater on the San Joaquin Grant, which is now part of a national forest. Uh, and they claimed the land and they declared it the independent Republic of San Joaquin. Um, they even arrested some forest rangers in a citizen's arrest for trespassing in their new newly declared country. Um, sometime later in 1967, uh, they, they staged a raid on the courthouse in Tierra Maria, uh, where they hoped to, to arrest the local district attorney for violating their civil rights, right? So instead of just enduring police brutality, enduring Anglo conquest, enduring their lands being stolen, they had flipped it on its head and they said, we're going to go after the district attorney and we're going to arrest him for violating our rights. Um, of course, that didn't go well. It ended in an armed confrontation and a manhunt. And Reyes Lopez Tierrina had to flee, and um, you know later becomes known as the King Tiger, right? He's compared to some of the the leaders of the Black Power movement that's happening at the same time, um, and ultimately is caught and imprisoned uh, for the Tierra Amarilla raid. But he also, you know, along the way, he formed a partnership with Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, so by 1968, Dr. King was organizing the Poor People's Campaign in in Washington D.C., and and the goal was to try to uh, uh, get an annual minimum wage and other sorts of justice for poor people of all, all colors. So Tierrina formed an alliance with King and, and brought a Chicano delegation, right, uh, even after Dr. King's death, to the encampment in Washington, D.C. as part of this campaign. So those are some of the origin strands. These are the different parts that inspired the Chicano movement. This is the early end, right? This is the people who would give inspiration to the young people, right, who come along in the later 1960s. And here you can see some of them, right? The movement moves from the countryside, from the land grants and the farm workers, rural Crystal City into the cities. And it, we see a, a bunch of, again, diffuse local movements taking shape across the Southwest. In Denver, 
Corky Gonzalez, um, you know, emerges as a leader of a group called the Crusade for Justice. Corky was a, a Democratic Party activist in the 1950s. Again, he worked on the Viva Kennedy campaign. He was involved in the war on poverty in Denver. But in, by 1967, he concluded that the Democratic Party establishment wasn't doing enough to, to fight for, for Chicanos, for Mexican Americans. And so he formed the Crusade for Justice, which particularly focused on young people and on fighting against police brutality and also fighting for improved education. Right? The schools at the time were, were often segregated. The, 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 the curriculum was entirely Anglo-centric. Uh, and so they organized um, uh, uh, their own school. They believed in self-determination. They created the Tlatelolco local school right in 1971, uh, of course, named after the terrible massacre in Mexico City. Um, and they, uh, they um, proceeded to educate themselves right in Chicano history. Um, Corky Gonzalez is also well known as, as one of the great thinkers of, of, the, of the Chicano movement, one of the people who put forward the ideas of Chicanismo very powerfully. Uh, he wrote a poem called I Am Joaquin, which you again, Google I Am Joaquin or Yo Soy Joaquin, and you can read this powerful poem in which he celebrates, again, the brownness of Chicanos, the fact that they are uh, caught in a gringo society right, and, and uh, not Mexican and not American, but something else, something new and something better, right, something more powerful and something that they, again, should take pride in. Like Tierrina, he participates and, and the organization participates in the Poor People's Campaign, um, and then they organize a National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference in March 1969, and it's at this conference that they have developed really the manifesto for the Chicano movement, which is called El Plan Espiritual de Aslan, Right? And again, they put forward the idea of Aslan as a homeland and um, a conquered homeland that they wish to reclaim. And they put forward a lot of these other ideas. Um, OK, I'll, I'll move on from Corky. In the middle of the screen, you can see Los Angeles right? Uh, and the East L.A. blowouts, um, the uh, movement of young people in, uh, in, in East L.A. schools uh, led by the guy in the middle, their teacher, Sal Castro, as well as you know, more students than we could possibly name. These students, again, in the spring of 1968, they were facing all sorts of problems in the schools, right? They, they, their teachers were predominantly white. Um, they were still being beaten for speaking Spanish at school. Uh, you know, the, they were discriminated against in all kinds of ways. They were tracked into vocational education instead of toward college. Um, and, uh, and so they, they began coming together and talking about this. And, and uh, they were excluded from student governments. Um, there was a series of Chicano youth leadership conferences held up the coast in California, uh, or they would hang out at a local coffee shop called La Piranha on the east side, the Piranha. Um, and in and, and these conversations, they came to realize that they had these problems in common. And students from the different high schools on the east side started hanging out together, started talking about these issues, started trying to make plans. Um, and they linked up with the Brown Berets. And the Brown Berets were uh, a militant Chicano youth organization that was organized to protect and serve, right? Just like the police motto, but they looked more like the like the Black Panthers, right? They wore brown berets, and they um, their their goal was to to protect their communities uh, and provide some basic services. And they also uh, in Los Angeles would provide security when the students decided to shut down their schools and march out in protest. So they do that. They call them blowouts or walkouts. Uh, Five high schools on the east side all go out together, and uh, and they and they go and they demand fundamental changes to the city's educational system. Um, some of them, including Sal Castro, their teacher, are uh, are later put on trial, right, for um, for uh, for their activities. Um, they're charged with conspiracy. They ultimately win that trial, but they go on, you know, to organize more conferences, more gatherings. They write a, a, a foundational document called the Plan de Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. And they organize a group called Mecha, the, the, uh, the, the biggest student organization of, of Chicanos, right? Uh, probably nationwide, certainly in California. Um, right, I, I don't think I have time to get into every story, but that's the East LA blowout. So there's a great book called Blowout, uh, which is an oral testimonial from, from Sal Castro with Mario Garcia. So if you wanna read more about it, you can, you can do it there. Or there's a wonderful film on HBO uh, called Walkout that is a, a fictionalized version of that story. Um, but right, they walk out from their schools in order to force the school district to actually make meaningful changes. Uh, okay, on the far right is, is Jose Angel Gutierrez, who I mentioned before. 
Um, you know, he, uh, as I was from Crystal City, he grew up there. He was the son of a doctor. Uh, he could see how his community was being mistreated, um, right? How they couldn't even afford to pay for basic medical services. And, uh, and he participated, right, at, at, at age 19 in the first Chicano revolt with Paso in 1963. He later goes to college at, at Kingsville and, and organizes a chapter there at Texas A&I, now Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, he's involved with the farm worker caravans, providing aid to the striking farm workers in South Texas. And then he goes to graduate school at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, where he comes together with another group of five, another Los Cinco, and organizes the Mexican American Youth Organization, or MAYO, which is created in 1967. Mayo quickly uh, spreads to other campuses and then across all of Texas and beyond. They go out and they organize at these different schools. As students engage in walkouts like the one in LA, they happened everywhere. They happened, uh, I mean, there were dozens of them around the country uh, and that's an undercount, right? Um, and all over Texas, high school students and college students were demanding educational systems that better met their needs. And everywhere that that happened, Mayo would show up and help them get a chapter organized. Um, a little while later, they organized something called the Winter Garden Project, where they where they took the previous example of, of Juan Cornejo, and they go about trying to win political power in Zavala County and several other rural counties in the, in the Winter Garden area of South Texas. And in 1968, they assist students at Crystal City High School who engage, again, in a dramatic walkout, uh, protesting, among other things, the exclusion of Mexicans, of Mexicana Chicanas, from the local, from the cheerleading squad at, at the school there. Uh, from there, they, they build a political party called La Raza Unida, the United People's Party, United Race Party. And Jose Angel goes on to become an elected official, school board member, uh, national chair of the Raza Unida Party. Uh, and right, he is still alive and, and still doing great work today. Uh, meanwhile, in San Antonio, there, there was a Mayo chapter, there was the Brown Berets in San Antonio, and they're organizing uh, very widely in local politics there as well. So who's missing from the story? Again, I would pause if you were here with me. The women, right? Where are the women? Why? Why are they missing? Well, here's one reason, right, that they were missing. This was one representation of gender of women in the Raza Unida party, very much a, a sexualized uh, a representation of women's role as supporters of the Raza Unida party, but not necessarily active agents. Here's another, right? She's armed. She's a, she's a, she's a brown beret. She's a, a militant, right? Um, so that was another role that women played in the movement. But more broadly, women did everything. You know, the reality was women were at the heart of the Chicano movement and Chicanas did this kind of day-to-day -day organizing that often goes unrecognized. So here on the right is Irma Mireles of, of San Antonio, who uh, was, a, you know, one of the main kind of day-to-day -day organizers who did the hard work of learning the law around elections, around of, of calling people to make sure that they were going to register to vote, uh, of recruiting candidates, right? A, a wide range of people. You know, this was, um, these were the barrio candidates from the Committee for Barrio Betterment in San Antonio, right? And you could see Gloria Cabrera was one of the candidates. Um, and so too was on the top left there and here, Rosie Castro, right? The twin, the twin's mother who was very active in the Chicana movement. And, and it was really the Chicanas who, who, um, who again, did the, did the spade work, did the daily organizing, um, maintained the offices, uh, but they were also asked to clean. And, and sometimes they gave speeches like Irma does here, right? They were also public leaders, they ran for office, um, but they, they had to fight um, a certain amount of sexism within the Chicano movement. And they had a rich debate among Chicanas about who they should fight, whether it should be the macho or the gabacho, right? Whether it would be uh, the, 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 the men within the, the community or, or, uh, or, or, or the, you know, the white culture uh, and racism. And in the end, they, they end up doing both, right? And they did both very effectively and were able to build organizations specifically for Chicanas while also building up the movement as a whole. Okay, I already talked about the plans, so I'm not going to go into great detail here, and I think I think I'm running low on time. So um, there is a, a picture of one printing of I Am Joaquin, that, of the famous poem of the movement. Uh, and again, I mentioned to you the plan Spiritual de Aslan that came out of Denver, right? And some of the ideas it put forward, that this is an indigenous people, that Aslan is their homeland, and that their, their job was to engage in, in, a, in a reconquista of the Southwest, a reconquest of the Southwest. They put forward the idea of cultural nationalism, of, of, of all people of Mexican descent being one people that crossed borders even, and they begin to embrace 
immigrants and become pro-immigrant rights, which was something new for Mexican-American politics in this period. They had debates over gender, as I mentioned, from the very beginning. Um, the Plan de Santa Barbara was a bold plan to open up higher education to working class Chicanos, and this comes out of the LA movement. Um, they, they demanded better student support services. They demanded the hiring of Chicano faculty, the creation of Chicano studies as a field, as full departments, right, where they could learn about, um, about their own culture. And they demanded community engaged te teaching and research. There was an expectation that all these, these first generation of Chicano students going to college would go back to the barrios and use their education to serve their communities. And they demanded that the university support them. And it, and it worked, by the way, right? The LA, you know, UCLA, for example, went from having almost no Latino students of any kind to suddenly, you know, hundreds and then more and more and more as students were able to finally break into elite higher education and then use that education to further the movement. So there's some legacies then. Um, the, the, the movement, of course, did eventually fade out. You'll have to read more if you to learn why and how and all of the details around that. Um, but the movement produced some very tangible legacies. It created what, what a friend, uh, a fellow scholar calls second generation movement organizations, groups like MALDEF, right, that is continuing to fight for uh, civil rights and voting rights today for Mexican Americans. They created the National Council of La Raza out of San Antonio, um, which is a, the biggest nationwide civil rights organization, the Southwest Voter Registration Project. Um, the IAF or the Industrial Areas Foundation, which is doing interfaith organizing all over. They, uh, we had a chapter here in Tarrant County for some time, which I think we're, it's a little defunct right now, but uh, Dallas Area Interfaith is, is one um, legacy of, of this Chicano movement and the interfaith organizing that, that one uh, they began to do coming out of it. We also see, um, right, more broadly, huge cultural transformations. You know, before the Chicano movement, uh, Mexican Americans really weren't well known outside of the immediate Southwest. And in the immediate Southwest, they were subjugated to Juan Crow, right? And, and barred from good jobs, good colleges, all of these things. We see now instead, right, that the Chicano movement put Latinos on the map, right? And, and it created a pathway into the middle class. It created political representation. Today, now we see again, a, a resurgent immigrant rights movement. And this is a, a movement that again, the Chicano movement helped to uh, help to create, help to mainstream, help to win Mexican-American support for immigrant rights. Um, we see, of course, improvements on education. Uh, and I mentioned this curriculum project. We actually helped with Fort Worth ISD creating a, a Latino studies curriculum overlay uh, so that students, you know, all throughout the district K-12 uh, have access to Latinx studies curriculum as part of what they do. And you know, more broadly, right, there's Chicano studies, Latino studies, Mexican American studies courses everywhere. So the movement had this massive impact, right? Looking back today, it's hard to even remember um, what life must have been like before it. But the reasons that, that we're here today, the reasons we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, the reasons why Chicano, Latino, Mexicano, uh, Central American students have access to higher education, have access to good jobs, have a, a culture that's more accepting and reflective of them, right? And we're working still on educational equity every day, right? But the reason that, uh, that, that we're all here, you know, in very concrete terms, having this conversation is because the Chicano movement, they went and took these risks. And it wasn't, you know, I showed you a bunch of leaders, but it was really about ordinary people, men and women who carried the struggle forward and who really truly um, won uh, won these changes in in our society. So here's a handful of books that you could read about it. I know you can't see them all now, but they're all on these different subjects. I also mentioned the the Sal, uh, Sal Castro memoir with with Mario Garcia. It's called Blowout. If you want to learn more about Rosie Castro, just Google them. Um, and hopefully, I, you know, if you're interested, I can get you access to these slides and and just provide you with a a longer reading list if you want to dig in even more. Um, and this is how to get a hold of me. So. I really appreciate you all being here today, and uh, it's wonderful to get to share this quick dive into history with you, and um, thank you all for having me. All right, and I guess I'll stop my screen share. All right, all right. Um, um, so, so just, just before, before we go we on to the Q&A session, sessions, which I think we have just a few minutes for, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that the silent auction is now closed and thank you for all of those who participated. And now on to the q and A. I I think we have about one question I think I saw is from Dr. OU it says, 
What led you to become a Chicano slash Latinx historian? Oh, good question. So, um, Brian, I'm not I'm not Latino. I'm uh, I'm from the West Coast. I'm from Nevada. Um, I'm from Jewish extraction and also from a family of activists of of labor movement and civil rights activists. And so, for me, growing up in the West, it was very apparent that race was not just black and white, and that if we wanted to uh, create a more democratic society for me, for my family, for my kids, and and really achieve any amount of social justice, if we wanted to combat capitalism, we needed to, we needed to learn more about about fighting racism, right? And for me, that that meant learning from my neighbors. I grew up with some some Mexicano neighbors that taught me little pieces, and then um, you know I I just kept going deeper. And um, and I'll say, you know, I think um, you know there's 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 a lot of you know a lot of attention to race right right now because of the uprising that has happened um and and you know in, in the united states latinos are now the largest minority group right the largest group of folks of color i don't even like saying minority because in texas very soon if not already latinos will be the plurality right and so everybody who lives in in america needs to understand the latino experience um as part of being a, a, a you know a, a functioning member of our community right and so it was important for me to dig into that and to the stories that have been sidelined and lost and to also you know push our nation to think about race um you know beyond black and white i'm also a scholar of the african-american experience i dive just as deeply in to african-american history but i think it's very important that we that we understand those especially in a place in like texas that you can't really understand one without the other. You have to put them into conversation. And so um, I got into that, right? How did, what, what happens if you look at the relationships between African and Americans and Mexican Americans in the long civil rights era? Uh, and so I ended up writing a whole book that was on that last slide about, about that process of, of, of different communities organizing separate movements, but then also building coalitions together. Um, but for me personally, you know, it's really just about wanting to create a better world. And that means I had to educate myself and now I have um, the opportunity to help educate others. Awesome, awesome. So you're getting um, lots of appraisal in the comments, lots of thanks, <laughs> thank yous and commandments. Okay, I think we have, oh, we only have one minute left, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So thank you, Dr. Crockmall, for sharing the very insightful information on the Chicana movement. Um, Yolanda, are you ready to present the winners of the silent auction? Is Yolanda here? Hello? Okay, she's not here yet, so looks like we're gonna wait a little bit. Yeah, great comments, great comments. We love that. We all need to know about the Latinx, Chicano Americans. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to take another question if we're just killing time. I don't. I don't see any more questions. I do see I, most of them are. Just, okay, here we go. Any recommendations on books slash resources if people are interested in diving deeper, maybe specific to Texas? Yeah, okay, let me just share the slides again real quick. And then, um, sorry, it should be. Oh yes, there's another question I was saying. Could you put up the last slide with the contact info? My, my bad. <laughs> no, it's all good. So that's my contact info. That's the book I wrote called Blue Texas. Um, actually, let me give a, a little shout out here. This is the Civil Rights in Black and Brown Oral History Project uh, that that I helped, you know, that I direct and that we created it has a million interviews. Well, not a million. We have about 500 interviews, 8,000 clips. You can go to our website, crbb.tcu.edu, and uh, and and learn any of this for yourself. You can kind of search for little clips about whatever place interests you, whatever subjects interest you. And then here's the reading list again. So, um, oh, okay. So Mario Garcia's blowout again was the one I mentioned. Um, and uh, and yeah, so the other Texas ones, so Mon David Montejano's book, Quixote Soldiers, a wonderful uh, introduction to the movement in, in San Antonio. Um, these, this first one is about the farm workers. The next one, Chicanas, this is a uh, LA book. Um, Ignacio Garcia is, a, is a, te a Tejano, a Chicano from Texas who, who wrote a bunch of great books, so you can look him up. Um, let's see, I mentioned at the very outset, Mo Maceo Montoya's book, Chicano Movement for Beginners. 
I really would start there. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It has nice little um, illustrations in it as well. He's an artist uh, and I didn't even get it to talk about the, the Chicano art movement. Um, so yeah, these are all these are all good ones. And then um, another good introduction is this one, Rethinking the Chicano Movement by Mark Rodriguez. So yeah, those are some books um, and I, I can get them to uh, uh, the folks who sponsor me being here and, and make sure that you all have access if you need them. And there's my contact info again, so. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if we should move on from the Q&A onto the um, winners of the silent auction. Oh, there's one more question. OK, let's see. Okay, wow, so um, I, I'm actually, yeah, now I can see them, I couldn't before. Um, folks who say they have connections to Crystal City, to the to the, the marches. Yeah, the, the website again is crbb.tcu.edu. You can see it, that should put it there. Yeah, did that work? Yeah. Then looks like there's another question. How will you be collaborating with TCC soon? Will you talk about your work with Dr. Peter Martinez? Yes, I, I know Dr. Martinez. I'm happy to work with him all the time. We're both part of a group that's doing work on local history, um, uh, historians of Latino Americans, Ola, Tarrant County, uh, and of, of course, uh, other folks from Ola, I think, have been involved today. And um, and yeah, also Dr. Martinez is sponsoring uh, the and others the, the next meeting of the Knox Tejas FOCO, the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies. Tejas FOCO uh, will be hosted virtually, I think, by TCC. And so um, I'll be, I'm sure I'll be part of that. Um, and yeah, there's, there's um, you know, the great thing about history is anybody can do it. So check out our website, you know, look in, um, look on the newspaper, take a history class and, and we'll, uh, if you're interested, we'll find ways to help you get started. All right, we have one more question. What about suggested videos slash films on the subject? Yeah, great. So, um, so there's the series Latino Americans that came out a few years ago. One episode of that uh, focuses on on the Chicano movement years, but there's actually a wonderful older documentary um, that last I saw was available on YouTube. I don't think, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if they have the license, but it's it's here on YouTube. If you look up Chicano History of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, you can find that. It's four parts. It's it's a little dated, but it's really wonderful stuff, and it has great archival films. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, more broadly, uh, the, the film Walkout again, the HBO films that uh, uh, Edward James Olmos uh, is in and also uh, produced. That's a really wonderful film on the subject. Um, and, we, and we need lots more. You know, we, we don't have enough of those stories yet on, on film. OK, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Crock Um I'm just going to go ahead and close, go on to close the event. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to mention that all the silent auction winners will be contacted by the committee. And on behalf of the Office of Equity and Inclusion, I wanted to thank all of you for joining the 11th annual Ab Abrazando Al Exito event and hope you enjoy the breakout sessions and our keynote speakers. We would like to thank our speakers today for sharing their experiences, culture, and knowledge. We hope to see you at next year's Abrazando Al Exito event. Thank you so much.